to today's episode of Myeloma Crowd Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Elstrom, and we'd like to thank our episode sponsor today, Takeda Oncology, for their support of the Myeloma Crowd Radio programs. Now, as patients, we're all always asking how far out a cure might be for multiple myeloma, and I'm very excited to share this show with you today to talk with a renowned myeloma researcher who's trying to prevent myeloma from happening in the first place. Um, so welcome, Dr. Gobriel. Thank you, Jenny. I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> We're excited to have you. Uh, before we get started, let me give a brief introduction for you, and then we can start in with um, some questions that we have and your study that you're uh, launching. So Dr. Gobriel received her medical degree in 1995 from Cairo University School of Medicine in Egypt. She completed her internal medicine training at Wayne State University, Michigan, and her hematology subspecialty training at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Dr. Gobriel is attending physician of medical oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and associate professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. She's director of the Clinical Investigator Research Program at Dana-Farber and director of the Michelle and Stephen Kirsch Laboratory. Um, Dr. Gobriel specializes in the field of multiple myeloma and Waldenstrom, macro, uh, I can never say this word, <laughs> it's all Waldenstrom, <laughs> Um, specific, and specifically in the precursor conditions of MGUS or monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance and smoldering myeloma. She focuses particularly on the role of malignant bone marrow niche in disease progression or what's happening inside that bone marrow microenvironment and why patients are progressing from these early conditions to active myeloma. Her laboratory research has been rapidly translated to innovative investigator-initiated clinical trials, and this has included over 10 Phase one and two clinical studies, one of which we're going to be talking about today. Um, she is a co-leader on the first consortium of clinical trials for blood cancers in collaboration with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society to form the Blood Cancer Research Partnership which is a consortium for innovative clinical trials of community oncology sites coordinated by Dana-Farber. She also initiated the Center for Prevention, per, sorry, Prevention of Progression of Blood Cancers, where patients with these early conditions like MGUS, MDS, and CLL are monitored um, even remotely. You don't even have to go to Dana-Farber to participate in these studies. And the myeloma study, the P-Crowd study, is a really important tissue bank study that we've talked to uh, many of you about before and shared collecting samples from patients with precursor conditions. She's now the lead primary investigator for a new clinical trial that received a major grant from Stand Up to Cancer. So, Dr. Gobriel, um, we're so happy that you're working on these conditions and for your deep, deep research for multiple myeloma patients. Thank you, Jenny. And again, it's all because of all the support we have from the patients and the excitement that every patient brings to the table so that we can actually change this disease and prevent it. Yes, I agree. Well, maybe you want to give just a little bit of background for people who may not be familiar with your work on your work in precursor conditions. Like, um, why did you begin investigating this hypothesis to treat earlier potentially, and, and how did you form the peak crowd study, and what was the rationale behind that? Yeah, absolutely. So I trained at Mayo, and many of you probably know that the person who coined the name MGUS, monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, is Dr. Bob Kyle. Uh, he's over 90 years old, and he still works and is excited about research. And I was trained by him, and he's the first one who actually started not just naming the disease, but collecting a large cohort of people who lived near um, Mayo Clinic in Olmsted County, and said, well, those people have a small monoclonal protein, but they have a potential chance of developing myeloma in the long term, and we should carefully watch them and see them. And that has been the standard of care for all of these years. For the last 50 years, we see people who have an early precursor condition, MGUS, or smoldering myeloma, and we tell them, watch and wait. Just keep waiting until you have end organ damage, until you have bone lesions, fractures in your bones, kidney failure, anemia, and then we treat you. And over the last few years, we've realized that, one, we have so many new options of therapy that are 
amazing in myeloma, yet we never use them until patients progress. And two, we understand better the disease and we understand better the biology of the disease and that the cancer cells already formed and already acquired so many changes early on that just waiting doesn't make any sense. And it's a simple question, you know, um, if I have today early breast cancer uh, and I go to my doctor, they would never tell me, uh, why don't you just wait and leave that lesion where it is until you have metastasis everywhere and you're fracturing your bones from metastatic breast cancer and then I treat you? Obviously, that would be completely uh, you know, unacceptable. Yet we do that every single day for myeloma. We tell everyone, wait until you have lesions and then we treat you. Um, so the reason why I started this, I don't want us to do this. We want to completely change the way we think of it and treat our people patients early and potentially prevent myeloma from happening uh, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand that, and I, I think it's a wonderful approach. So what have you learned so far? Because I, I know there's been so much that you've learned over even the last five years, and I even saw a recent study talking about um, how they divided patients into two different smoldering myeloma groups and found one group would progress faster, like one where the genes had already mutated, and um, the other where they were still kind of in that mutation process and took longer. So you've learned an amazing amount. Can you share those some of those findings? Yeah, absolutely. So again, thanks to everyone who supported P-Crowd, the precursor crowd um, initiative that we started a few years ago. We collected many samples from many patients, and we were able to understand better how smoldering myeloma uh, genomically is characterized, meaning what are the changes in the cancer cells. And that's just one step. We have so many other steps to try and understand how progression happens. And in that study, uh, and we presented it last year in the American Society of Hematology, and we're getting ready to put together the uh, paper and share it with everyone, we found that indeed smoldering myeloma is very heterogeneous, meaning some people may never progress and some people progress very fast, and they may actually have the same numbers, 10% plasma cells and M-spike, that's 3 grams. So how can you differentiate it uh, when we don't have uh, an, an actual biomarker? So we did all those um, studies called next generation sequencing, where you do something uh, to look at the specific changes at a single um, point at the single DNA change. We call them uh, uh, single nucleotide variants or mutations. And we found that indeed some patients who have specific mutations, KRAS, NRAS, BRAF, or translocations or something called MIC amplification or translocation, they progress much faster to myeloma. So that adds a lot to the clinical markers that we have and potentially could be used as a better predictor, a better biomarker for who will have a high likelihood of progressing to myeloma. So in the future, we expect that we take a sample from a patient, whether it's the bone marrow or the peripheral blood, as we've talked before in one of the prior radio uh, discussions mm -hmm. of the blood biopsies, we could detect if those patients have those specific mutations or alterations and say, indeed, you have a high chance. Let's get started on thinking of early intervention, on early therapy, so that we can prevent progression. Okay. Well, perfect. Um, and similarly, I know there's been a lot uh, that you've done with smoldering myeloma. Are you... Also spending, I mean, just looking at MGUS in the same way, because I know some of these studies include both smoldering myeloma patients and MGUS patients. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of the clinical trials are on smoldering myeloma because it's much more advanced and it makes sense to uh, treat early. However, we said, well, maybe we're actually targeting a clone that has already progressed. When we say high-risk smoldering myeloma, many people already have mm -hmm. changes in their bone marrow that look exactly like myeloma. So can we even go earlier with some novel ways of thinking, like either single agent deratumumab, which is an antibody that we use for myeloma, or vaccine therapy, or something that can alter the immune system and prevent progression even at an early time. And we have a clinical trial for high-risk MGUS and low-risk smoldering myeloma that's open for single agent deratumumab. We're hoping to open uh, vaccine trials for smoldering myeloma and then bring them to an earlier stage later on. And we're hoping to start understanding better how to target the immune system early so that we can give a vaccine and 
at an MGA stage and say to everyone, this is it, we don't need to uh, think about it in the future. Sort of like what we do with infectious diseases and other things, a way of prevention completely. And of course, I think it's important to talk about uh, the PROMISE study now because that's really targeting how we can detect early. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to talk about it later on or not, but I'm happy to discuss it. Oh, no, we can start now. Sure, sure. Sure. So the whole idea of the PROMISE study uh, and this hopefully will launch in the next week or so, is um, we see people who have been incidentally found with MGAS and smoldering. You go to your doctor, you have a high protein level or some slight anemia, and that's how you're diagnosed with MGAS or smoldering myeloma because you're asymptomatic. You don't have symptoms, you don't have bone pain. But we're missing so many people. So everyone walking down the street who has MGAS and is not diagnosed uh, is potentially someone who will develop myeloma in a few years from now, and we didn't do anything to find it. And the the uh, part that was interesting is that when we go to our regular doctors for screening, we screen for breast cancer with mammograms, we screen for colon cancer with colonoscopy, yet your doctor never tells you, why don't I do just a blood test to screen if you have a myeloma or not to look for blood cancers. We do not have we do not have a screening test for blood cancer, and we want to change that. So we said let's launch a large study, 50,000 individuals. But instead of screening everyone, because the chance of developing MGUS is only one percent uh, or three percent, sorry, in, at the age of 50, and then it increases with age. Let's look for people who have a very high chance of developing myeloma, and that includes an African American population because there's three times higher chance of developing myeloma, and they may develop it even at an earlier age. So at age 40 or 45, an African-American patient may be at a much higher risk than a Caucasian. And then the other thing is let's get people who have a family member who has myeloma or a lymphoma or a B-cell malignancy, meaning if my brother and sister or one of my family members has myeloma or has MGUS, my chances of developing myeloma is also very high two to three times higher. So let's ask everyone over the age of 45, so again, young population, so that we can potentially find myeloma early and prevent it, up to the age of 75 and screen this population. And we were very lucky that Send Up to Cancer believed in this idea that we will screen for a blood cancer. We will change the way we think of primary prevention. And uh, we will do this all online. So you don't have to come to Dana-Farber. You can just be wherever you are in the United States. We uh, want you to register online. And in fact, you can already start sending us your name and information by email. And it's promisestudy at partners.org. Um, and Jenny will have it available for everyone again. But in this case, you can register online. We will send you a kit uh, from Quest Diagnostic, uh, sorry, from GBF, where you can go to Quest anywhere uh, cl close to you or any of the other institutions where you can get your blood drawn. And it will be tested at Mayo Clinic to see if you have the M spike or not. And if you do, we would be calling you. One of our nurses will call and say, yes, indeed, you have an M spike. Let's uh, get you connected to a hematologist or oncologist close to you. Let's make sure that indeed we understand what's going on with you. Do you have MGUS or smoldering and follow you? And if you don't have it, well, the first thing is you get to know that you don't have it, which is good. And two, we will follow you again in three years to make sure we, you don't develop it again in three years from now. And this close follow-up of 50,000 individuals, both having it or not, will help us understand why certain people develop it, why certain people are at a high risk. We will ask epidemiology questions like uh, medications, uh, health uh, changes, exercise, uh, you know, med, uh, diabetes, other things that can lead to progression in people. But we will also do genomic studies as well as studies on the bone marrow samples from the positive cohorts, from the people who test positive, to try and understand how can we prevent myeloma from happening in those people who have MGUS and smoldering. And this will be the first time in the United States we look at people who are actually screened for this disease and not found incidentally. So we're very excited about that. It's truly a promise for us to change the way we think of myeloma and potentially prevent it completely from happening. I think it's amazing that uh, it just makes so much sense to me as a patient that this earlier screening is is not that expensive. It's not hard to do. And I don't know, it just makes so much sense because it saves you so much time, money and 
pain in the long run. So what a wonderful study design, and I'm just thrilled. Um, maybe you want to also talk about um, the team behind this, because I know you are the primary investigator and you have kind of this wonderful team in place. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we call them dream teams. Stand Up to Cancer calls them dream teams, and in, indeed it is a dream team. We have six different institutions. Dana-Farber is one of them, but we have the Broad Institute, MIT, the Harvard School of Public Health, Johns Hopkins, Mayo Clinic, and all of us together are working on this one idea. Let's make sure that we get the samples, understand better the disease, call the patients, um, and follow them up uh, until we understand better how to prevent it. I can tell you within here, Dana-Farber, we have a huge number of people working on this just to coordinate it. How are we going to have everything streamlined? Uh, we've worked very closely with many people, um, and of course with our advocates, and Jenny is one of them, of course, making sure that mm -hmm. everything we do and we develop is uh, discussed with you to make sure that this is really uh, delivering something that patients like and understand and are willing to be part of. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's fantastic. So I have a question, too. When you said you're they're being tested, they don't have to send in um, – I mean, they, they're sending in samples, basically, or having a test run at a local facility. How do those results get back to you? Um, do you just go to the – how? just walk me through the steps that a patient might go through to – to go get a sample and then get that sample to you. Yeah, absolutely. And our website will actually have a very nice animation of the whole process so that people can see it and understand it. But let's say that okay. you go on the website and register and say that you're interested. We will uh, send you a small questionnaire. You fill in the forms. And then uh, the kits are being developed by a company called GBF. And we're you know, very um, lucky and appreciative of all the work that has been developed by many other uh, companies that are working with us, not just uh, through the DREAM team, and that includes GBF and Quest Diagnostics and, of course, uh, the Broad Genomics Platform and the Mayo Clinic Labs, because they've really been instrumental in developing this, as well as the Fred Hutch team. They've developed for us the uh, platform for all of this integration of the systems and the IT behind the scenes. Um, so the patient will log in. We will send them uh, the kit that's already prepackaged with all the information. They would go to a local Quest Diagnostics uh, where they're already trained to know what to do with those samples. They get their blood drawn within hopefully five to ten minutes. And um, then this sample will be sent part of it to Mayo Clinic and part of it to the Broad Institute for the research. And the Mayo Clinic sample will be tested whether they have uh, myeloma or not. So this is the M-spike and the serum free light chain. That information gets back to us at Dana-Farber. And we have a registered nurse who's trained to uh, tell the patients whether they are positive indeed or not. And if they are positive, then we also help them uh, through our collaborations with the Inter International Myeloma Foundation and the MMRF uh, to get uh, into um, one of the local oncologists or hematologists in the area, and we help them get all the tests that are required to understand better whether they have MGUS or smoldering myeloma. We ask them to still send us more of those research samples as they're going through their clinical routine studies. And then we follow them every three to six months or every year, depending on, of course, the disease status um, until progression. We also have, then we, this is a cohort of people who are always connected with us. It's basically like a social media uh, network in a way. They can call us anytime. They can connect with us. We will give updates through the website. We will have information for everyone as we go along. But also we will offer clinical trials for this specific cohort to tell them about the new advances and the new options they can have. The people who screen negative, we will ask them uh, if they're okay to be um, reconnected with us again in three years and we get another sample from them. Um, so it's an opportunity for everyone who has a family member with myeloma or who is, or who is African American uh, over the age of 45 to get tested for free and get to know whether indeed they have this or not and then be part of this community uh, who's changing the way we think of myeloma and, and offering us uh, this amazing benefit for everyone else in the future. Mm -hmm. It's a very valuable service, I think. And um, one thing that I think is important about this is that if they do test positive, 
I, I kind of want to stress this point going to that you're going to help direct them towards an academic facility where they can be appropriately followed and potentially treated if need be by a myeloma specialist versus um a general oncologist who might not who might be seeing, you know, 20 different types of cancers. Do you want to talk about that a little bit about the importance of being able to follow them um with a myeloma specialty team? Yeah, absolutely. I think that myeloma is a rare disease. We're not saying that you have to go to an academic center, but we're encouraging, especially if someone has uh, advanced disease or something that requires therapy, it would be a good idea to ask an expert. Um, And that happens for every disease, but myeloma especially uh, is relatively a rare disease. And if you are going to get therapy, uh, we're here available at many academic centers, available to give an opinion and say what are the best options. And then it depends on the patient. Some patients cannot travel too far um, and want to be treated locally, and that's fine, but it's a good idea to potentially have just one opinion and have some input from the experts. Uh, what we try to do with the BCRP, which is that consortium, is we provide some of that care to all the community sites and some of those clinical trials to all of those community sites who Uh, who are working with us. So trying to deliver that same expertise care back into the community. Um, That requires a lot of work, but at least it's one step forward for that. And how many clinical trials are there currently in these early precursor conditions? And why should patients consider joining a clinical trial if they have one of these conditions? Yeah, absolutely. So clinicaltrials.gov has the list of all the trials, and you can go online and see them and see which ones are available. But of course, it's very confusing because you'll see so many criteria. So that's why it's important to talk to us, and we're happy to help anytime. We have created here a center for prevention of progression. So the whole thing that we're doing at Dana-Farber is specifically focusing on early prevention. We want to actually see you, uh, anyone who has MGUS and smoldering and has a question, we're happy to see you, give you our opinion opinion, give you advice on what to do. And for some patients, watch and wait is fine because your risk is very low. But if your risk is very high to develop myeloma, this is when we start telling you about all the potential options we have available. Um, And some of those, again, are online. I don't want to discuss them now because either they close by the time someone comes or they're not available yet. (laughs) So I'd rather have those very specifically later on. Uh, But again, email us, call us, come for a second opinion anytime. Uh, we're hoping to launch soon uh, the physical clinic where not only uh, MGUS and smoldering are seen, but also other precursor blood cancers are seen in the same clinic uh, so that we truly have the first center, the first uh, cancer center that focuses on prevention uh, for our patients. Well, I think it's totally amazing. Um, In terms of study length, you mentioned that if patients test negative, they'll be checked after three years. Um, What is the complete study length, or does it end after a certain period of time? Well, we're hoping that this will be something like what Bob Kyle has created 50 years ago, and it never ends. It keeps uh, giving Mm -hmm. you more and more information, more uh, help. Um, So uh, the funding is only for a few years, but we expect that this will be so rich and so useful for us and for many uh, other scientists in the world that we keep learning from it in the future. Um, So I hope, um, you know, years from now, and I'll be gone, but this study keeps going on uh, and help everyone. Well, I hope so. I hope you're another Bob Kyle because he still comes to the office every day and does research, even at 90. It's amazing. He is. completely amazing. Yeah, there's only one Bob Kyle. Well, Well, you're pretty unique yourself. I, I think it's amazing. So um, can you tell us what you will do with the findings and how long do you think it will take to generate new insights? I know it's kind of a difficult question when you're planning a clinical trial and and launching it, but um, I think it's important for patients to know where you're headed. Yeah, absolutely. And it's important also to have realistic expectations of how fast we can get information because, um, yes, we will sequence all the samples as fast as we can, but sometimes we need long-term follow-up to understand the implications. We need the years of follow-up sometimes to understand, indeed, this changes progression or not. However, what we're doing in PCROWD is we have the samples of patients who already have MGUS and smoldering, so already we're learning from what we have now, and we can implement it Uh, to understand better 
uh, on the new samples and on the future studies. So it will keep changing. And I can tell you the um, technologies that we have right now may not be the same ones two or three years from now. We're improving so fast and uh, having so many new ideas and so many new technologies that uh, what we do now could potentially be useless in two or three years from now, and we will have even better and better ideas and uh, better technology to understand the disease better. Uh, so we're uh, encouraging people who have MGUS and smoldering myeloma right now, please go on PCROWD and register and give us your samples because today we can do this sequencing and today we can understand better what's going on with your disease, and that can help us immediately, but also can help the future studies of PROMISE study and for future other patients. Mm -hmm. And just one thing to point out also is that, um, and, and I'm glad that, so the PCR crowd study will be an ongoing study. That won't really have an end, will it? Correct, yes, and we're uh, ramping up the website for this one so that the uh, PROMISE and PCROWD uh, will be basically sister websites and Patients who have MGUS and smoldering and get to know about PROMISE, and we tell them, well, you're already known to have MGUS. Don't get disappointed. Just go to P Crowd, and you can still help us, and you can still be participating in it. So these are two sister websites, two sister studies, basically for anyone uh, who either will screen and uh, is a high risk but does not have MGUS, or for people who have MGUS and smoldering and are already known to have it. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Well, there's one other tool that I think might be helpful in this situation. So we've created this tool called HealthTree that we've been talking about. And in that tool, you're able to find a myeloma specialist, and you're able to see all the active um, clinical trials that are also available. And I know I'll be talking to you about, um, because we'll be providing that data to researchers. So if patients also want to participate in HealthTree, uh, we could share that data back with you for this study that could potentially give more information for patients that you're trying to, um, whose data you're trying to look at as a as a whole product, you know, a 360 degree view of the patient, I think is important. Um, yeah, absolutely. So you talked about, yeah, you you talked about, um, and that's on healthtree.org if people want to create a profile there. Um, you talked about asking people about their medications, their health, their exercise, their genomics. One thing that you've been studying for a really long period of time is the bone marrow microenvironment, what's happening inside that bone marrow. And also, um, there's a lot of new work being done, it seems like, on the immune system status of individuals. Like, why do some people, why, you know, maybe it's the immune system that's holding back the progression of the disease, um, or maybe it's something that's happening in their bone marrow, or maybe it's a combination of the two. Do you want to talk about those? two factors or what you've learned about those two things? Yeah, absolutely. So the the one thing that sometimes intrigues us is that sometimes the cancer cells already have many of the changes and mutations even at an early MGUS stage. But why would those cancer cells not keep growing and develop into myeloma within a year? Why would they sit around for 10, 15 years? Uh, what's holding them off? And this is when we realized that um, Cancer cells are not just sitting on their own. They live in an environment. And you can think of that ecosystem and how important it is on supporting or preventing cancer cells from growing. And we think part of that ecosystem is the immune system. So within the bone marrow microenvironment, the cancer cells sit, but an immune cell can tell it, can tell it no, you cannot keep growing. You are... Um, you know, sitting there and we will watch you carefully. Or you can have an immune system that's lazy, that doesn't work very well, and in that case, the cancer cells will keep growing and proliferating, and there is no policing, basically, to prevent it from progressing. So potentially, by understanding how the immune system works and how the microenvironment works, we can understand how to control the disease from growing, even if the cancer cells exist. Um, and this is very important because we have now something called immunotherapy, like the immune checkpoint inhibitors and the antibodies and all of those things that we have that can target the immune system and make it grow much faster um, uh, or make it stronger, basically, to police those cancer cells. So one of the things we've done recently, and this we're hoping to present in the American Society of Hematology meeting in a couple of months, is something called single-cell RNA sequencing, meaning we take the bone marrow cells and we look, yes, at the cancer cells, but we also look at all the other cells around it. And instead of looking at them in bulk, think of it as looking at uh, a forest versus a tree. 
if you can look at every single tree and understand better how it looks, it's very different than looking at the whole forest and not having the specific details of each tree. <clears throat> So single cell mm -hmm. RNA sequencing is basically that. You look at every single tree, you look at every single cell and understand the genes that are inside this cell. And you can tell, are there more T cells? Are there more B cells? Are there more NK cells? But not only that, are they changing in a myeloma patient versus a normal sample? And what has changed in them and can we target that by developing drugs or antibodies that can improve on the immune system to prevent uh, myeloma from growing. Mm -hmm. Very important. Um, one of my other questions was just overarching. Um, what other strategies have have you seen change in the past five years or so, five or ten years, or clinical practice changed in learning all these new things? Because it seems like the technology, immuno, the advance of immunotherapy, the technology that you're using to test the genomics of the disease are really radically changing the treatment paradigm um, and influencing that. Uh, so what over, overall strategies have you seen change? Yeah, I think over the last five to seven years, we've seen a lot of advances in genomics and understanding better at a very, very deep uh, level the mutations and the alterations that happen at the DNA, at the RNA level, but also at the epigenetic level. And these are all in the cancer cells. Then we look at the immune cells, and this has been, again, a huge change in the way we think of how to target cancer cells by looking at that interaction between the microenvironment, immune cells, and the cancer cells. And all of the new development, not only um, in technology development, like single cell uh, level of studies, but also understanding how to develop therapies for them. We also have all the CAR T and all the ways of manipulating the immune system by cellular therapy, by using your own cells uh, to activate your own immune cells, and they can kill cancer cells. And this is a huge change in how we treat patients. So there are lots of oh, changes yeah. uh, within uh, not just the treatment, but also, like you said, technology development. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing the progress, and it's amazing the pace to me because the pace seems to be going so quickly. So going back to basics, we, we've been on this 50-city um, city tour for to introduce this new platform called HealthTree. In one of our meetings, uh, we were in New Mexico, and um, one of the patients said, you know, I went to this general oncologist. I was diagnosed with MGUS. And he told me I had one to three years to live and I'd better get my affairs in order. No and so I think in general we need better education about some of these early conditions. Uh, and for people who are listening that might not be familiar with some of the conditions, can you kind of just give a brief overview of MGUS and what that means and smoldering myeloma and what that means and high-risk smoldering myeloma? I know we're kind of seem, seeming to go backwards a little bit, but... I think it's important for people um, who want to participate in the PROMISE study and um, might not understand what these conditions are. Yeah, absolutely. So there are two precursor conditions to myeloma, and they're the, the divided but, uh, by, by certain numbers, but those numbers are arbitrary because, again, a patient is not, you know, if you have a certain number of cells in your bone marrow, uh, it, and it changes by 1%, that doesn't suddenly change your prognosis. So I will define what are, what are the numbers, but just be careful that a patient is very unique and your own uh, progression and your own changes is not because suddenly you've changed from MGUS to smoldering myeloma. So what is MGUS? MGUS is monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. Long, big name. We know it actually has an un, a, a determined significance because it can go on to myeloma, so the name should be changed. But having said that, it means that you have a very small number of precancerous cells, uh, plasma cells, which are the myeloma cells, and they may already have some changes in them, but they cannot keep growing on to develop myeloma. So you would have less than 10% of those cancer cells in your bone marrow, uh, but you do not have any of the other changes, meaning you do not have anemia or bone lytic lesions or renal failure or hypercalcemia, and you do not have some of the new criteria we have, like a light chain ratio, a serum-free light chain ratio that's very high, over 100, or uh, by an MRI or a PET-CT scan, 
a couple of lesions in your uh, bones uh, or a, a significant number of plasma cells in your bone marrow, which is that 60%. So if you have none of those, you do not have active myeloma or symptomatic myeloma. And then if you're less than 10% in your bone marrow or less than 3 grams protein in your blood, then you have MGUS. And why is this important? Because MGUS in general, if we put everyone together who has MGUS, the chance of progression is only 1% per year, meaning in 10 years, uh, you have a 10% chance of progressing to myeloma. In 20 years, you have 20% chance of progression to myeloma. That's a very, very small number. So if you're age That's 60 right. or 70, uh, I'll tell you, you know, when you're 90, you have 20% chance of developing myeloma. This should be the least of your problems right now. You can have 10,000 other things that are, you know, a headache for you rather than the MGUS. So this is important to not scare someone and tell them you have only one to three years of survival. That's completely wrong. At the same time... Oh, no, I thought it was mold- ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that's really unfair for a patient to have that. Um, and when I talk about we see our patients and we do prevention of progression and we do all of that, that doesn't mean that we're changing in any way how low the risk of developing progression. We're just saying for people who have higher risk, and I'll talk about that, we can do something to prevent it from happening. So now smoldering myeloma is the next step up before it goes on to develop myeloma. And I say that, but sometimes we never detect exactly the differences. We cannot tell you, well, you know, next year maybe you will be smoldering and then the year after you will be myeloma. We're not very good at predicting who will progress and who will not. And that's why it's very important to go on and keep following your pay, your doctor, even if you have MGUS, even if your risk is very low, keep seeing your doctor once a year because it's the people who stop following up. Uh, they're the ones who develop myeloma and we don't know, and then suddenly they come in with bone pain and it's too late because they've developed already the disease. So don't stop seeing your doctor at least once a year if you have MGUS. Now, if you have smoldering myeloma, this is when you have more than 10% plasma cells in your bone marrow. And again, you know, a lot of my patients will tell me, I'm at 9%, so I'm MGUS, but they do another bone marrow biopsy on the other side, and I'm 11%, so I have smoldering myeloma. How is that possible? And the answer is, Yes, we put those numbers, but they don't mean anything for you. Your cells, whether they're 9 or 11%, won't make any difference. So these are distinctions that we use so that physicians can talk to each other so that we can define better biomarkers, but they do not change your own prognosis as a patient, and that's very important to understand that. Um, In general, smoldering myeloma has a chance of 10% progression per year, so much higher uh, than the 1% per year. Um, So if you, uh, in five years, you would have 50% chance of progression, and this is when it starts becoming um, hard to understand. Let's say you're 40. When you're 45, you may have myeloma. That could be a problem. And then a specific subgroup of those people with smoldering myeloma, we call them high-risk smoldering myeloma. They have a very high chance of developing myeloma. These, within two years, they have a 50% chance of developing myeloma. And there are different criteria for this. There is the Mayo Clinic criteria, the Spanish criteria, the modified new Rajkumar criteria. There is different ways, so we don't have to go into those details, but just a subgroup of people, when they have those markers, it indicates the cancer cells are ongoing, they're growing up, they're, you know, they're changing things. You have a very high chance of going on to develop end organ damage in the next couple of years. So you may have no symptoms now, but be very, very careful. You may have symptoms very soon. And these are the ones that we're offering now clinical trials to prevent progression because we know at least by the Spanish study, that some treatment is better than observation in preventing progression in those patients, in preventing the lesions and the kidney failure and so on. And this is why we're doing all those trials to prevent progression in the high-risk group. Um, So Mm -hmm. I I don't know if that clarifies it or confuses it more. I know it's it's very confusing for many patients. (laughs) No, it's a wonderful overview. And I think if patients, especially if we're reaching out, to people who've never heard of these conditions before or family members of people with these conditions, it's really important for them to know the basics. So that was just a great overview. Thank you so much. Do you have any idea how many many people in the United States um, and maybe a breakout, um, you know, Caucasian versus African-American who might have one of these precursor conditions? 
just curious. Yeah. So it's very important. We know that uh, we know a couple of facts. Uh, when uh, the study by Dr. Kyle was done in Olmsted County, he basically screened that whole population, and he found that indeed the uh, 3% chance at age 50 for having MGUS, but these were mainly Caucasians uh, in Olmsted County. When the NCI with Ola Langer looked at uh, a larger cohort of people who had blood samples stored for 10 years, and they went back for all of those people, they found that indeed that number uh, reflects the whole population and not Olmsted County. So again, 3% chance in general at age 50 to have MGUS, and then it keeps increasing with age. So it gets up to 9% at age 70 and so on. So as we get older, our chance of developing MGUS is much higher. However, what he also found in that study is the African-American population is three times more common to have MGUS, and as well, they are much younger when we can detect it. So at age 40 and 45, you can find MGUS in an African-American population. Other studies that uh, Ola Langern has done, as well as the um, Studies by the Icelandic group um, have found that the family members also have a very high chance of having MGUS. Uh, and this is why we picked those two numbers, the African-American and the family members, to be the ones that we think will have about a 9% chance of having MGUS or smoldering myeloma when we screen uh, for them. Mm-hmm. No, it's just, it makes so much sense to identify people early. Um, so... This study is beginning in about a week. You'll be able to have open registration. One question that I think is important is how can patients best help you in this study? Because I think patients want to help advance your research. People were really excited when we told them about the PCROWD study, and there were many people that helped to share that information. How do we reach the 50,000 people that you want inside this study? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is... uh, Yeah, it's all going to be driven by patients, actually, and by uh, healthy individuals. So I would say every single patient who has MGUS or smoldering myeloma or myeloma, talk to your family members. That's the first thing. And if they're interested, give them the website, give them the information or our email, uh, promisestudy at partners.org, and tell them to register. We would love to see uh, everyone. And, of course, if you're African-American over the age of 45, uh, please consider the study. It's an easy blood test. Uh, it will require minimum amount of work, of time uh, from you to go to the uh, phlebotomy center, but hopefully that can change the way we think of uh, following our people and our patients and screening uh, everyone in the future. We hope that this will be a blood test that will be part of the routine care your primary care doctor will do. But we cannot do that and we cannot change the way we think of screening until you actually participate in the study. And if you have neither of those, um, please use social media, please talk to your uh, neighbors, please in any of the myeloma events, um, talk to people in the churches, in anything. If you can just tweet about it, uh, talk about it in Facebook, this is the way we can tell everyone about the study and help uh, get the 50,000 patients accrual. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Also, inside of HealthTree, we've also asked a question. We allow researchers like yourself to ask the patient community questions, survey questions. And one of the questions in there is, would you like to participate in the study that you have, this PROMISE study? So we will share it as much as we can, and we'll show it, share it in our groups and on social media also. Um, because Wonderful. this is really a key – well, it's a, it's such a key study – to learn how does this even happen because when you look at active myeloma, I've had so many people say, well, myeloma is just not a single incident. It's something that's probably, hap- you know, you've probably had MGUS at some point. There were probably certain triggers that triggered it into myeloma. And if we can figure that that out um, and we and we can see that 360-degree view of the patient, then you can come up with better hypotheses about who should be treated and and with what. So I think it's just really critical. Absolutely. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, I want to leave some time. And we want to thank you, Jenny, again for this. (laughs) Oh, sure. I I think that I... I've just seen so many researchers like you that are very talented and very bright and doing amazing work, and I think patients can help accelerate a cure. I really do. I think by uh, even simple things like sharing something on your Facebook page, um, yeah, it's it's wonderful. So 
anything that we can help do to help um, help people avoid getting myeloma. <laughs> this is not a club that any of us want to be in, <laughs> so it's not Absolutely. something we're excited to join. We we don't want patients to have to go through active myeloma. So if they have early conditions that they can, st- you can stop progression. It's it's fabulous, and we just applaud you for all your efforts. Okay, we have several questions that I would like to, um, if you have a question, um, you can call 347-637-2631 and press 1 on your keypad. And we'll start with caller at 380-8060. So go go ahead with your question. Go ahead with your question. Are you there? Are you there? Okay, I think they might have had me on speakerphone and I weren't, weren't sure. Okay, 9836757, go ahead with your question. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Dr. Gobriel. This is Dana Holmes, a proud <laughs> to be smoldering Hi, tea crowder for the past three and a half years. Hey, I've Dana. Submitted, yeah, hey, I've submitted 12 samples of serum to your brilliant researchers and two bone marrow samples. And obviously, there's more to come. As long as I keep smoldering, you'll keep getting my samples. So well, maybe, you're maybe the universe star. will keep me smoldering for that <laughs> purpose alone. <laughs> Dr. Gobriel, of course, thank you for everything you do. It's just such a, um, um, a pleasure to work with you and your team and just the way that you have supported our smoldering and MGUS communities with your um, willingness to, you know, engage in social media. It's just incredible. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. It's really a lot of your work, Dana. So we thank you, actually. Yeah, well, my 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 part is really easy, just kind of, you know, getting people excited about your um, <laughs> programs. It's They're really, they're, they're just so terrific, and they're so easy to participate in. And this PROMISE study sounds even easier than, than the P-Crowd study. Um, just I, I just want to clarify a couple of things. Um, so it would really be for people over the age of 45 who are at the highest risk of potentially having MGUS or smoldering myeloma, that being a first-degree relative, and or African Americans, because we know that patient population has a higher risk. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. What about first-degree relatives who have other blood cancers, would they be eligible, or is this strictly for myeloma? No, we allow also walvis from macroglobulinemia because it's very close to it. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't recall that we've allowed CLL or other B-cell malignancies, although they may have a high chance. I have to go back and see if we decided uh, it could be too confusing, so we kept it very um, okay. uh, strict about just myeloma, MGA, smoldering, and Waldenstrom. Okay, great, because then we'll be able to um, encourage the folks who have IgM, MGA, and um, Correct. smoldering right, to, to participate. Um, Correct. And then just to go over the, the, the idea with the labs, we get our kit, which is similar to, to pre-crowd. We take it to Quest Labs or our own um, myeloma facility to have that uh, sample drawn, correct? Correct. And then how do we send them to you? Are we getting like a FedEx envelope like we get with PCROWD, or is this something that the labs then will send on to the Mayo Clinic? How does that part work? Do you know? Yeah, we made it even simpler. So Quest uh, has actually agreed that they will do the FedExing for you. So they'll take wow, the kit that's a, that's and a big they'll plus. do everything. Yep. That's a big plus. Yep. Great. Now, Dr. Gabriel, what about, um, I know you, you guys are going to be testing M-spike and serum-free light chains. What about for an MGUS that might be too low for these tests to actually detect? Are you guys going to think about adding an um, immunofixation just to kind yeah, of pick great. up those really <laughs> small MGUSs? Yeah. Great question. So actually, uh, we have a very good collaboration with Mayo Clinic. Not only we will do SPEP, serum-free light chain, and then reflex with immunofixation, we will have all of the samples uh, getting done by mass spectrometry. <gasps> um, no way. Wow, spec- that's exciting. Yeah. It is. Mass spec uh, is a way that can detect an M-spike much, much 
better and in a much higher sensitivity compared to the routine testing by serum protein electrophoresis. That's it will still be at a research level, but we believe that that potentially can detect some of those cases where it's a slight change, but we're not sure, and then the mass spec will give us more information. But it will not be a clinical test. It will be a research test, and then hopefully in the future we can switch it to become a clinical test. Oh, okay, so mass spec is going to be under the research end of it. Okay, Correct. I gotcha. That's wonderful. You know, last week Jenny had an interview with Dr. Stephen Lipkin, who specializes in clinical genetics at Weill Cornell, and he was um, talking to us about some of his research being done on um, – a, uh, a germline gene called KDM1A. And the, he was basically explaining that the data shows that individuals who carry that germline mutation are predisposed to um, familial multiple myeloma. Is that something that your work, either in P Crowd or someplace else, has also supported? Because he also said that he's working with a, um, a genetics company to create an actual multiple myeloma gene panel that would include this amongst other um, genetic uh, codes, so to speak, to, to, to kind of sort that all out. Because, you know, that's really important for us any of us that have families and, and children, you know, this is a, a big concern. Whether we get them tested or not, um, you know, should we encourage it? Should we wait? You know, it, it's always a, a, a gray cloud over my head personally for my, my family. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing, and maybe I did not clarify it, is because we're picking only high-risk people, we are asking an important question. Why an African-American or a family member would have a high risk of developing myeloma? And in fact, we have both the people who do have it, the positive cohort, as well as a control group who doesn't have it but has the same high risk uh, for being an individual, or either first degree relative or an African-American. So we're doing germline sequencing for all of those patients and also comparing it to the general population sequencing that we have at the Broad Institute because there is a huge effort, of course, to understand germline genetics, which is what you're saying exactly. Am I at risk and what am I carrying and what will I give to my um, uh, offspring as a potential risk. So this will be all definitely part of the study. And because we have a big number of people, then we will have the confidence to say, yes. indeed, if this is truly related or not. Because right. you need That's a large number of samples for something like Absolutely, this. you do. Because, you know, right now we're hearing that um, our children could perhaps have a two- to four-fold increased risk, which, you know, when you think about it, it's not a whole lot. Um, but it might be more because we don't know enough about it. So this is a wonderful, wonderful initiative, and I thank you for it, and I thank all of your supporters who are providing you with the funding to do this. And, and I'm going to be calling my family members. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So, thank you so much, So we'll Dana. be doing that. Well, thanks, Dr. Go Real. Thanks, Jenny, for having this wonderful forum once again. Take care, guys. Okay. Thank thanks you for again. Thanks for your question. And we have another caller at 491-3434. Go ahead with your question. Uh, Dr. Gogriel, thank you very much for, for this work. Um, it seems to me, while it makes sense to try to treat people earlier, um, it seems that that um, concept is premised on a couple of things. It, one is, which is that we um, can sort of reasonably accurately identify who the true high-risk patients are, and I'd like to uh, get a little bit more uh, color on your thoughts as to whether or not we're at a stage where we can re um, reasonably feel like we can identify that group of people and also whether or not um, treating those people sooner rather than later is not going to do more harm than, than good. Are we at a point with the treatment options where that calculus is sort of more favorable to the patients? Yeah, great questions. So let me take them into uh, two parts. The first thing, uh, are we at a stage where we can truly understand who's at high risk? And let's talk just at the high risk smoldering myeloma. The clinical criteria we use right now, which is the M-spike, the tumor burden, uh, light chain ratio, and all of those, uh, whether you use the Mayo Clinic criteria or the Spanish or the composite, the one that has all of those, are really good in saying, indeed, those people have high risk. It may miss some people who are intermediate risk and should actually be in the high risk. That's why the genomic data could be important in adding this information. And it may um, 
if you add the IgA or some other factors into it, it may put someone at high risk who's not. So it's not a perfect, perfect biomarker, but it's pretty good in detecting most of the population who's at high risk of developing myeloma. We are working on improving it, and the uh, IMW, uh, the International Myeloma Working Group, is working on a consensus recommendation of how to truly define this group. I think as we develop better genomic markers, meaning the MYC translocations, the MAP kinase pathway, uh, all of those things we will re um, will refine this a little bit to be even better in predicting who's at high risk. The second part, so, so at least the criteria of high risk that we have right now may not be perfect, but are not that bad. They're pretty good in detecting most of the people who will be developing high risk. The second question is, should I really treat or will I cause more harm? And that's actually a very important question. I get that every single day. So one of the there are several things for this. The first thing is the tumor clone, meaning the cancer cells, by waiting for them to grow on into symptomatic myeloma, there's nothing that uh, will help them improve. They will just get worse and worse and will acquire more and more mutations. So there is nothing beneficial from allowing them to go on to eat your bones and cause kidney failure. It, there is no benefit from waiting, basically. Um, <clears throat> However, what we want to know, especially at high-risk myeloma, is we do not want to sub-treat those patients. So if you're at high risk, doing a little bit of revlimid, doing a little bit of therapy is actually potentially more harmful because as if you're treating active myeloma with a single drug instead of the combination of drugs that we think are good. So one thing is if we treat, we treat effective therapy. We want to treat with drugs that we know are active, combination therapies, things that we know indeed will make a difference, at least for high-risk smoldering. For lower risk and things like this, yes, it could be very different. We can use the immune system to harness things and improve on it. We don't have to kill everything. So the idea right now is if you have high-risk smoldering myeloma, you may have basically everything that an active myeloma has, and we should consider real therapy uh, for those patients to kill as many cancer cells as we can, and that should uh, d make a difference in progression-free survival. The other thing is there is already clinical data from the Spanish group that says treatment with lenalidomide and dexamethasone, Revdex, versus observation changed the progression-free survival and the overall survival of people. And those that progressed later on, they had no harm. They did not develop a worse uh, myeloma uh, after they stopped therapy. So the one thing that's important to remember is in the smoldering studies that we do, we treat for a certain number of months and then we stop. And that's important. We do not keep treating you forever because that's when you may acquire resistance by a small number of, you know, by maintenance therapy for a very, very long time. We treat for two years and then we stop because even if you, so if you had an, an excellent remission and we stopped, there is no more that drug uh, effect that could potentially develop resistance. Basically, we're allowing the system to restart from scratch and allowing it to, be, to go back into an MGUS-like stage or potentially in if it is in a great remission, hopefully that doesn't come back for years and years and potentially may be cured. Um, so the idea is that effective therapy that restarts uh, the system from scratch potentially helps the immune system to recover. So using immunotherapy, using vaccines, using other things will be very important. Um, and not sub-treating it uh, and stopping therapy and not continuing on forever are steps to make sure that indeed we can make a difference in the survival. So I just want to follow up quickly. I mean, so the thought is that we're not creating necessarily resistance by treating early because, um, I mean, that's that's sort of, um, I guess, an important point. Is that, is that right? I mean, Correct, yes, yes. So if I told you I'll give you only 5 milligrams of Revlimid and you have high-risk smoldering, that can cause resistance, as if I'm treating active myeloma with a very small dose. But we're not doing that. And we have not seen a single case of resistance because of those therapies that we're doing. You're basically saying instead of treating a patient with active myeloma when they have lesions in their bones and kidney failure, I'll treat them a year before or a year and a half before when they have the exact same kind of cancer cells, the exact changes, but they have not cause damage of the bones and damage of the kidneys. Uh, and at least this is true for the high-risk disease. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks for your question. Okay, we have another caller question at 7281356. Go ahead with your question. 
Hi, yes. Um, my name is uh, Jill Zitzwitz, and I'm a myeloma patient. And I was actually interested in, about things that trigger myeloma because it seems like anecdotally on our patient support groups online that there are a fair number of people who have autoimmune conditions. And I actually do have an autoimmune condition, Graves' disease, and I also um, had a car accident, a severe one that caused a lot of inflammation about three years before I was diagnosed and where I got my compression fractures. And so since I'm the mother of four, I guess I'm wondering about, you know, risk factors for my kids and just in general whether stress or inflammation is a common risk factor that could trigger a smoldering or MGUS condition turning into myeloma. Yeah, great question. Um, so we don't have all the answers, um, and that's why actually part of the PROMISE study, we're doing all of this epidemiology work, so we will have a long questionnaire for everyone to answer questions like this. Have you had autoimmune diseases? Are you on specific therapies? Is diabetes or medications? Any of those things that we think could uh, allow the system to change. So I talked about the microenvironment, but there is also a big environment, which is inflammation of the body, immune dysregulation, which is this autoimmune diseases, um, other triggers that can allow the immune system to become in this array, and that allows the cancer cells to grow, or could allow that first hit to happen. Why would the B cell or a plasma cell become a cancer cell? Maybe something allowed it to grow so fast because of an infection or an inflammation or an autoimmune disorder, and by growing so fast, they get this mutation, they get this error while they're dividing. So we don't know all the answers, but part of this large cohort study is we will start getting some of those questions answered, and then they will require further research, of course. Yes, that's very interesting. I'm actually a researcher, and I study um, proteins involved in misfolding that relate to yeah. ALS and other uh, yeah. diseases. And so it definitely seems like there's this often this sort of second hit. So there's an initial stress that somehow gets, you know, enhanced by a secondary stress, like with head trauma and other things, for example. But um, yeah. That's, yeah, it's very interesting, though, that there seems to be these common themes that as we learn more about the body and how it works. But I'm glad to hear that you guys are um, looking into health histories and everything else um, to help with that as well. Yeah, that's, yeah absolutely. I really we appreciate love to your work wonderful with you. work. <laughs> so oh, I really absolutely. appreciate the work you're doing. Um, it does seem like there is a plus side to being uh, having an autoimmune condition because I certainly responded very well to therapy. So I don't know if maybe my hyper alert immune system also went on attack pretty well, so I'm doing quite well. Yeah, it's, that you. could be very interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you very much yeah, for your amazing. time. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for your excellent question. I love that question about autoimmune um, disorders. And I think as you uh, accumulate patients into this study with the, such a big cohort, you're going to be able to see some of these patterns. And it's also a question that we are asking in Health Tree because um, you know, more rapidly, maybe we can aggregate a whole population of myeloma patients, family members, and then um, contact people and say, hey, you have a family incidence of myeloma. Would you like to participate in this study? So we look forward to helping you through that tool. Well, Dr. Gobriel, we are so grateful that you have um, helped us better understand this study, this important PROMISE study. And we know that it's going to help identify amazing things for us as myeloma patients and for people with these precursor conditions to avoid this disease as much as possible and for as long as possible. So thank you so much for all you're doing. And we just really appreciate your time today. Absolutely. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you again, everyone. It's really a pleasure and an honor, really, to uh, work with everyone. And it's truly, uh, this is driven by patients. Uh, so uh, I actually want to thank you all for this. Well, thank you so much. And we will be posting a link for registration on our website as you have that available. And any other um, materials to help patients learn more about the study, We'll be posting that as well on the website. So just watch for that on the MyelomaCrowd.org website, and uh, we'll just keep you up to speed on this PROMISE study. Sam, so, we thank you for listening to um, Myeloma Crowd Radio, and we hope that you will tune in next time to more, learn more about the latest in myeloma research and what it means for you.
step into the world of power, loyalty, and luck. I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. With family, cannolis, and spins mean everything. Now, you wanna get mixed up in the family business. Introducing The Godfather at ChompaCasino.com. Test your luck in the shadowy world of The Godfather slot. Someday, I will call upon you to do a service for me. Play The Godfather, now at ChampaCasino.com. Welcome to the family. VGW Group, no purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. See terms and conditions, 18 plus.